First, it is necessary to recognize the limits that a Eurocentric view has imposed upon the intercultural dialogue between an author such as Gabriela Schurrisland and the world. I would like to draw from my own experience in this regard. There is only one great writer from Bengal background who is known widely in the Spanish-speaking world. That is uh, Rabindranath Tagore, Kobe Lee. It is interesting to remember how such admiration took root in our country. Kobe Guru emerged into our perception by way of Europe. He translated some of his own work into, into English. <coughs> and uh, this brought to him attention and light at the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize made people pay attention. Among them, Juan Ramón Jiménez, one of the leading poets in Spain, and his wife, Zenobia Campos. They translated the work into Spanish. And this brought a great deal of recognition and uh, had an immense impact in the Spanish-speaking world. Three of our Nobel Prizes, uh, Neruda uh, and Gabriela Mistral, uh, were deeply impacted by COVID. No one can underestimate this effort that uh, Campo B and Jimenez made. However, the kind of um, translation that they created was uh, not exactly perfect. Uh, it was a translation that was limited and uh, mostly it was an adaptation into Spanish. An author has spoken about the creation of an Andalusia uh, Tagore, a Tagore that was more Spanish than it should have been. Uh, beyond this sort of alchemy, it is important also to mention that uh, Kobe Guru, the great majority of his work has remained unavailable for the Spanish-speaking world. Uh, this uh, Tagore that came into our consciousness was just the Tagore of the beginning of the century. The later Tagore, the Tagore that dealt with the effort for independence from the British, and uh, the Tagore that was much more complex, didn't come into Spain into the Spain and Spanish world. In this sense, um, this is an urgent situation because I don't think there was such interest among um, the British or the European establishment to bring into the consciousness of the world uh, authors that really dealt with situations uh, of anti-colonialism. This also explains why a poet such as Nasrud Islam was never into our radar. It didn't come to us. Uh, the absence of Widogi Kobi from the international scene is a manifestation of a regrettable phenomenon. I would like to call it the sieve effect, a filter that has historically stopped the flow of communication between people, such as Latin America and Bangladesh in this case. In Nasrud's time, that filter was dictated by the colonial system. In our time, it is predicated by how we seek the mark of approval from the European and American establishment before allowing ourselves to perceive any merit in other literatures, and instead of daring to explore and judge by ourselves. This unfortunate situation, nevertheless, is not permanent. It can be challenged, and it's precisely in the work of thinkers such as Nasrud that it is possible to find inspiration and guidance in this respect. Here we have a boy reared in a rural area facing very high odds. Here we have an orphan. Here we have a youngster reared in the splendid and multicultural tra traditions of Bengal. Here we have a man that could not contain his passion for learning, not only from formal sources, but also from the authentic knowledge of the land way before such a path was to be appreciated in the West. A man, moreover, capable of analyzing culture, war, and history with such sharp understanding that in his, his early 20s could write from a prison a piece such as his Rajbandir Jamalbandi. In Nashrul, we have a key example of a fully decolonized intellect. Way before such nomenclature was to be conceived and popularized, this exceptional capacity to outdo the colonial burden cannot be overstated 
or it is essential element that allows him to become literally the Rohi, the rebel. He is indeed a case of Bellum Refaceri. He incarnates the urge to confront an unjust power, not from a subaltern place, but from a position of equality. He is unburdened from any sense of inferiority. When he writes, high is my head, he is not indulging in any metaphor, but describing a fact internalized in perfect consonance with an unbound consciousness. The testimony of a political prisoner can be thus clerk as one of the most daring essays, not only in reason of his flawless structure and reasoning, but also because of his central premise. Nasrud places himself in the position of the universal citizen, <coughs> totally unencumbered by prejudices and above all intolerances. In an exercise, he proposes to consider the fight against injustice from a point of view perfectly unbiased. If India was the colonial power and Britain the colonized country, the British would have a right to revolt, just as the Indians were justified to revolt against the British colonial power. As I have mentioned before in a study dedicated to Kathy Nashville's plan, such an analysis calls for everybody to inhabit the place and the condition of the other. The other being understood as the foreigner, the outsider, even the enemy. It is unnecessary to insist in how extraordinary is that call now as before. For something that can be defined in our age is the capacity that we as a species have developed to reject our fellow human beings and to encase them in the role of the other. It dwells in the concept that nowadays we rarely invoke without pernicious irony, liberty, fraternity, love. To remind his readers that reality, in reality there is no other. It searches to humble those mighty and full of prejudices into recognizing that truth. It calls for people to reject the specter of that artificial order used in so many cases only to generate discord for despicable purposes. It requests us to bring our gaze inward and to reflect in our common nature, in our common human nature, without renouncing to outward action in the quest for justice. It brings into our consciousness the necessity for ideality, even in the face of disappointment. In the task to convey these truths, Nansrud made use of all the splendid symbols he harvested during his formative years and beyond. By doing so, he proved his ability to subsume into a coherent system the complexity of our all-inclusive background. He also opened his heart and intellect to writers and philosophers from every latitude. He said that he did not write only for Bengal, but for the world. A world, a world, that is now enlarged the city to hear and to understand the message of that universal life. Thank you so much. In this presentation on the University of Nusr Islam, we certainly need more such uh, presentations and essays on Nusr. I'd now like to invite uh, our next uh, speaker, Tobias Biancone, uh, who is truly European. Uh, he was born in Switzerland. He writes in German and is based in Paris. He's the director of the International Theatre Institute uh, in Paris. And he's a poet. And I would like to invite him to read from his poem, or poems and translate them for us, perhaps. in German and some in English so that you can understand them. And they are out of, of three books which were published in German uh, with Japanese footprints. And I'm also happy to announce that my poems, all these three books have been, the poems have been translated to, to Bangla by Shofi Ahmed and they are illustrated uh, by Shambhu Acharya, uh, traditional Bangladeshi painter, and they will be released on the 9th, 100 poems. And I look forward to 
see the books in English and in Bangla in a few days. Um, this is thanks to my dear friend Kamendu Machandar, my dear friend uh, Shofi Ahmed who translated them, and a lot of other people who are participating in that multiple work. Sh my friend, the big poet, Transu Hock. Um, so this is a big event, so that I cannot read them in Bangla. So I read the first poem in German. Bescheiden. Ein kleines Zimmer reicht mir heute, etwas Gastfreundschaft, etwas Wärme, ein paar Löffel Suppe, ein bisschen Brot, eine Tasse Tee. Einige angenehme, Wort, einige angenehme Worte reichen mir heute, ein versöhnender Blick, ein verstohlenes Lächeln, ein schelmischer Ausdruck in deinem Gesicht, ein Nicken, ein erleichtertes Seufzen. Eine leichte Berührung reicht mir heute, mit deiner warmen Hand, mit deiner frischen Wange, mit deinem mir vertrauten Körper in einer langen Umarmung. Etwas Nähe, etwas Wärme, etwas Verständnis, etwas stummes Übereinstimmung auf meiner großen, unendlichen Reise. Nur jetzt, nur für einen Augenblick, nur hier, nur du. Now the same poem in English. Humbleness. A small room serves me today with some hospitality, some warmth, a few spoons of soup, some bread, a cup of tea. Some kind words serve me today with a reconciling look, a furtive smile, an impish expression on your face, a nod, a sigh of relief. A light touch serves me today from your warm hand, from your chilly cheek, with your familiar body in a long embrace. Some closeness, some warmth, some understanding, tacit agreement on my great never-ending journey. For now, just for an instant, just here, just you. And out of the book of Masquerade, to be free. To be free means to be alert. To be free means to grant respect to life. To be free means to be pre prepared for fight, to fight for one's own freedom. To be free means to be oneself. To be free means to be proud of freedom itself. To be free above all means to be alert. out of the love poems, somewhere, someone, somewhere, somewhere someone will embrace you, kiss you and love you, someone, to somewhere someone will share the way with you, to somewhere, from somewhere someone will join you, from somewhere. Somewhere you love someone, someone loves you. Someone, and yet not just anyone. Somewhere, somebody, someone. Sometime. And the last one is a bit out of the first book. It's called The View. I do not come from anywhere. I do not go anywhere. I am the way I am, a mountain, a tree, a lake, a sky. I do not come from anywhere, I do not go anywhere, I am. Thank you very much. I'm going to now invite German Rückenbrot, whom I must confess I haven't had the pleasure of meeting the conference is this is here so if you will, if you will excuse me uh, because I didn't have the uh, kind of background information necessary if you belong again at an international poetry festival and I'm extremely happy to be here especially because
for the second time. A book of mine is being published in Bangla, translated by Amin Rahman. I'm going to talk a little bit about international poetry since I'm a Belgian poet living in Spain and also a translator and publisher of international poetry. Of course, in 20 minutes I cannot mention all the good poets of the world, you know, so I have a limit to a few of them. Most poets, like other artists, used to hold their finger on the pulse of human beings. Their poetry is therefore generally a reflection of their time. And the verses used to be an expression of the spiritual, political, and even economic situation of that period. It is undeniable that World War II and Rebel I have left deep traces in modern European poetry and made a drastic cut from the romantic poetry from the 18th and 19th century. However, the horror of the wars and the misery of people did not result at all in a culture in India. On the contrary, as Bertolt Brecht wrote, even in dark times, people will sing. They will sing about the bad times. In fact, the first half of the 20th century, starting in 1910, with the expressionistic movement, followed by the Italian Futurismo, Dadaism, French Cubism, Surrealism, and the explosion of artistic movements, not only in painting and music, but also in poetry. As far as human memory reaches, nature used to be one of the main poetic topics in the past. But what about the modern poet, where the majority of them lives in the forest of skyscrapers? Can the poet continue to praise the beauty of nature, when his gracious face is covered with wrinkles and scars, when the air is polluted and sunlight causes disease? Is speaking or writing about trees, as Bertolt Brecht questioned, out of fashion, a crime? At the end of the 19th century in France, we often have been, who has often been the predecessor of a new movement in Europe, the so-called Parnassian, revolted against sentimental romanticism and proclaimed a new modern style. Important to note is that contrary to the romantic poets, the Parnassian did not describe nature anymore as a dazzling phenomenon but use it as well as a negative metaphor. Charles Baudelaire, whose influence on poetry continues until these days, entitled his collection of poetry, The Flowers of Even, Le Fleur du Mal. Using his personal experience of life, this poet Baudy did not express the beauty, but the tragedy of life, which the Romantics neither wanted to see nor to express. Hypocrite reader, my equal, my brother, he wrote. Hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. But he still regards nature as a temple. La nature est un temple. His greatest poems, such as Elevation, are one of a supreme musical beauty, and indeed, pure nature poems, as shows a stanza selected from that poem. I read it just a few lines ago. In English, above the lakes, above the valleys, above the mountains, the forest, the clouds, the seas, beyond the sun, beyond the skies, beyond the verges of the star covered spheres. In the French, au dessus des étangs, au dessus des vallées, des montagnes, des bois, des nuages de mer, au delà du soleil, par delà des terres, par delà des confins. Influenced by Baudelaire, other French poets, such as the unfortunate duo Verlaine and Rimbaud, elaborated the modern style, followed by a surrealistic poets like Stéphane Mallarmé, Apollinaire, Paul Éluard, Sonnechin, who initially belonged to the surrealist. He remained rather faithful to the movement. However, having experienced war, 
he also wrote plenty of anti-war poems. But also poems about love, or rather, the longing for it. But nature too, so colorful and rich in his Mediterranean homeland, plays an important role. Leading contemporary French poets are Yves Bonfoy, Bernard Noël, as well as the equally French writing poet from Luxembourg and his court, Swiss poet, Philippe Jacotet. According to Jacotet, poems are small lanterns in which still burns the reflection of light. Poetry is the lantern with which the poet searches for more light, for illumination, and he does not find it. If he does not find it in his own culture, he will look for it in other cultures where, excuse me, if um, it are those spiritual encounters which turn into an amalgam of new ideas, into new poems. Because the poem is not created from nothing. It is a creation of words with ideas, colliding as stars, and it are the sparks of the collision which make the poem. As pretends the Argentine poet Hugo Bochica in one of his verses, what the blind British king searches for is not the root, but the light. That is precisely what the poet searches for with his poems, a new reality, illumination, light, crossing borders, discovering other cultures, other philosophies. But poetry is not only for the poet, but we don't use them anymore. A new, a different language had to be found. As a result, during the first decades after the war, the Second War, one will not find romantic descriptions of enchanting poetry, German poetry. One of the most important German poets, Günther Eich, made an inventory saying what was left after the war. And he makes a list of it. Another famous poet was Peter Hooker, East German poet, who wrote about the war. One of his books is called Main Roads. Main Roads. I would like to recite which I translated from German. Schossin, Schossin. Strangled evening glue, crushing time, main roads, main roads, crossroads of escape, car tracks in the field, who saw the eyes of slain horses, the burning sky, nights with lungs full of smoke, with the hard breath of the fleeing when shots hammered. Twilight. As pollution became a worldwide threat, many poets wrote anti-pollution poems, such as Heinz Tchaikovsky, who says, from both sides of the river, lines of cars have with their fatal lips the green without, within range. He describes the deterioration of the natural environment an element which was most popular in German poetry of the 70s. Let me recite again a German poem, only by Ludwig Fels, Nature. Here round, said friends to me, shall we build a little house, at the property cows graze, and flowers grow in the clay. Here everything is still nature, they say, air and forest, Hills and fields, here we shall live. Without you, I said, natural it would remain. Not the East German poet who suffered under the yoke of communism was Rainer Kunze. He too became a severe critic of the system and was forced to leave East Germany. He, like Hugo, published a large number of regime critical political poems. Another example of Rainer Kunst this time, the end of art. You may not, said the owl to the rooster, you may not sing the praises of the sun. The sun is not important. The rooster took the sun out of his poem. You are an artist, said the owl to the rooster, 
and then it was strange enough, in spite of, or maybe because of the censorship in East Germany, some of the best poems have been written in German. But poetry flourished also in Austria with such fine poets as Ingmar Bachmann. So lucidly he wrote a poem called Every Day that says that the war is not anymore declared but continues, that unheard has become common and that the weak have been sent to the firing line. Have you, and to the Lame, it is their predictions since the wars in Iraq, Africa, Palestine, and Syria. Other fascinating Austrian poets are Erich Fried, Friederike Mayrecker, and Ernst Jander, who also wrote society political verses, such as My Aunt Song. In a world where everybody has a smartphone, an iPad, a Google account, and participate only in